The following program contains graphic material. Viewer discretion is advised. Derek Bird's hobbies isolated him from reality. The noises he heard were of betrayal by friends and family. So he took a decision that would scar a paradise forever. There is nothing, nothing more dangerous than a man who doesn't care if he's going to die. He began a killing spree by first targeting a blood brother. When he shot his twin brother in the face, he would clearly have been looking at a ghastly image of what was going to happen to himself. No one was safe, friend or stranger. The gunman was a good shot and was aiming at people's heads. Derek Bird saw himself as wronged by the world, so set about in what he thought was righteous slaughter. A town called Whitehaven, June 2nd, 2010. Mourners have gathered in a cemetery to commemorate the lives of school children killed in a bus crash a few weeks earlier. As hard as it was for the people of West Cumbria to deal with the tragedy, the day would get worse in a way that nobody could possibly imagine. At about 10.40, uh, one of the members of our emergency department team received a call from the ambulance service to assist at a shooting in Whitehaven Town Centre. He was about to go out to the scene when the ambulance service arrived and said, you know, the, the guy's still around shooting people. The guy was shooting and shooting and then shooting some more. Twelve will die, 25 others are seriously injured that day. Most of his victims were shot over two hours of relentless violence. The shockwaves really just went through everybody because even somebody who, who perhaps didn't lose a family member might have known one, two, three or, or, or more. Of, of the victims. The evil that would take place on June 2nd happened amongst the worst type of terrain to stop a gunman. The singular problem was the absolute spontaneity, but more than anything else, the, the great expanse and the difficult geography that's associated with Cumbria. Traditions are slow to pass in this isolated part of the country, but remoteness brings advantages. Community spirit is strong. Everyone knows everyone else intimately. We're dealing with a type of community that's far more face-to-face. Face-to-face societies are normally the best kind of cultures in which to be brought up in because they're very nurturing and supportive. But equally, if you lose face, in a face-to-face -face society, then that's much more difficult to put behind you uh, because, of course, everybody will remember. Derek Bird, a taxi driver, grew up near a paradise eulogized for its beauty by poets, but harboring some tough working-class towns like Whitehaven and Cleeter Moor. As he grows older, Derek drifts between low-paid jobs. One of his two brothers, David, would become a successful businessman they seemed to get on well. He was a twin. He had a twin brother. Twin brothers are normally very supportive and nurturing of each other. You rarely find twin brothers who are very competitive with each other. Derek's father and mother divorce, and the four men, father and three sons, spend a lot of time together. Later, friends would testify that the boys were discouraged by their father from showing emotion and encouraged into a world of country sports. We know that as a child, Derek Bird was introduced to guns and weapons and hunting from a very early age. The more rural that an area is, then the more shotguns uh, are, are going to be present. They are going to be, if you like, more excusable than they would be in, in an, an urban situation. In the 90s, Bird marries, but after having two children, the couple split. Publicly, he tells friends the divorce is amicable, but privately, he reveals a different truth. He had a bit of a bad divorce, I believe, and I think it'll go far, far back as that, you know, build up and build up and build up. He found it difficult to maintain a relationship. 
Soon after the separation, Bird suffers another setback in his private life. Facing accusations of stealing wood, he quits from his job as a joiner at Sellafield Nuclear Processing Plant. Few employers recruit those facing such allegations, so Bird became self-employed, working as a taxi driver. He was spending a lot of time alone. Soon, he fell out with some of his colleagues, who he claimed were guilty of stealing his customers. The taxi drivers, they used to, rather than waiting to become the first car to take a, a passenger, they would actually take them from further back and, and the first car never ever got the chance to go anywhere, you know? He's, he's sitting there longer and that used to upset Derek. He believed that these other taxi drivers were taking fares from him, uh, were making fun of him behind his back, were not giving him respect we're not giving him due deference. Despite the setbacks in his life and his irritation at fellow taxi drivers, Derek Bird was considered a sound friend. Derek came across a really nice person, very quiet, shy type of person. He was so gentle and, you know, all right, he was a bit untidy, and, but he was, he was a nice person. A lot of people said he was just a regular guy came across perhaps as a, as a little bit of a, of, a, of a bachelor. Later, it would be claimed that he was clinically depressed. If he was, local clinicians had no way of telling. There was nothing about Derek Bird that we can find that distinguishes him from any other West Cumbrian taxi driver. He was a perfectly normal person. But Bird's emotional state was not as most people believed. He confided in close friend and fellow taxi driver, Terry Kennedy. He's very worried about his mother. Um, apparently she was on the last legs at the time and he didn't really know how to handle it. Um, but a few of the lads tried to help him, but whether he took anything on board, who knows. Despite his anxieties, there was nothing to suggest that Birdie, as he was called, was losing control. Derek never ever lost his temper. Not that I know of, not big style anyway, you know. Um, and I think Derek just bottled everything up over the years. Bird did release tension by turning to the bottle. The weekend meant alcohol, lots of it. Uh, Derek loved to drink. He, well, he always drank too much on a Friday or a Sunday night. Uh, you'd have to see him banging off walls and things, and some of the lads would take him home and. He'd often go on about his problems when he was drunk, uh, mostly about his mother, really. Um, I actually seen him in tears more than once when he was talking about his mother. It was... that was a lot on his mind. When sober, his method of relaxation meant turning to the hobby taught to him by his father. He liked to go hunting with his gun. That bird was a heavy drinker who owned a gun was not enough to ring alarm bells. Gun laws in the UK are tough. Police are required to carry out checks on those to whom they give firearms licenses. Bird was not considered a risk. Certainly, he wasn't a gun nut or anything like that. He had guns, he went shooting, but all of his firearms were legally owned. Um, his doctors had no reason to suspect he was suffering from any mental problems. Um, there, there were no sort of warning signs that, that were missed. In West Cumbria, where reputation is so important, Bird is aware that the community knows he's suspected of stealing from a prestigious employer and that he has a failed marriage. He's convinced his taxi colleagues are stealing from him. His mother is in failing health and he can only seek solace in either heavy drinking or gun sports. Most of the time, he's bottling up his worries. I suppose all that's just come to a head and He's just lost the plot, basically. One day, he just exploded. Derek Bird's mind is spiralling out of control. He's a human time bomb, and he's ticking in paradise. At the taxi stand where Derek Bird spends his working day, he casually reveals that he plans on killing himself. Bird is reported to have said to a friend, um, that you won't see me again. And psychologists call this future foreshortening. You begin to see him closing down possibilities. 
not thinking in terms of months and years, but simply thinking in terms of hours and days. It was a startling thing to hear from somebody who generally seemed in perfectly good spirits. But what he said next was chilling. One witness actually said that Derek Bird had said to him, I'm going to make Whitehaven more famous than Dunblane, which is uh, where a lot of school children were killed um, in Scotland. And so this picture of quite a resentful man started to come out. Dr. Marin and Gregory has made a study in how men and women behave when they're under pressure. To Bird, crying about his troubles would have been inconceivable. When men are in a predicament where relationships are starting to break down and things are starting to go wrong, men are far less likely than women to actually open up and seek the emotional support and solace, or indeed the medical help that women are much more likely to seek out. So these kind of oblique threats that he's making are not unusual in these cases. They're quite often threats are made. Bird's isolation extended to his hobbies. I think it's quite interesting that the kinds of hobbies that he has, quite apart from shooting, are scuba diving. You know, quintessentially an individualistic kind of sport, albeit there's the, the buddy system in scuba diving. This is a very kind of solitary pursuit. He likes motocross, tinkering with cars, very hands-on, very kind of... Um, rural types of uh, behaviors and we also know that he liked going to Thailand. The visits to Thailand reveal another part of Bird's life where he feels a sense of loss. The divorcee finds it difficult to forge relationships with women. He turns to prostitutes, shares his Thai trips with fellow taxi drivers. Whilst there, Bird becomes a regular visitor to the country's notorious flesh pots. He was going to Thailand as part of sex tourism. We therefore know that he would be finding it difficult to establish sexual relations with women in the community of Cumbria. Even in Thailand, Bird believes he's ridiculed by his friends. On one trip, he falls in love with a young Thai girl who rejects his proposal to join him in England. People are going to find out about that, which of course is again another form of losing face. Not only losing face in Cumbria, but also losing face with the women he thought he could buy in another part of the world. To Bird, the problems in his life just keep mounting. By May 2010, he becomes convinced that the tax authorities are investigating him. The cab trade deals in cash, and Bird's habit is to hoard his under floorboards at his home. He had tax problems. Not massive tax problems, uh, as it turned out, but in his mind, he built up uh, a story almost that he was going to jail, that uh, he would lose all of his money. Knowing that he owes thousands of pounds, Derek turns to his twin brother, David, for advice, and he, in turn, suggests that Derek sees a solicitor called Kevin Commons. He also came to the conclusion that his uh, brother, who he'd asked for help with his tax matter, was trying to set him up, um, was somehow trying to get him sent to jail, and Kevin Commons, a solicitor, who again was asked for help, was also conspiring to get him sent to jail. So this, this, this completely incorrect picture was forming in his mind. This was not the first time that Derek Bird had become bitter towards his successful twin brother. Derek was convinced that he alone was entitled to £25,000 from his father's will. He believed that his mother, now seriously ill, had decided to change the will so that the money would be shared equally between the brothers. He sort of stewed and really let these, I suppose, grievances sort of bubble up inside him. And they did think he was, yeah, an angry man and he wanted basically revenge. Derek Bird's job gives him a lot of time to consider how he might take that revenge. Driving allows him to fantasize. There's a sense in which Bird gradually builds up, whilst driving in his car, a sense of action, a sense of is he going to be a man or is he just going to be jokey old birdie or is he going to stand up and be counted. By now, the grudges borne by Derek Bird formed a long list, and when Birdie heard the latest taunts from his fellow cabbies, he wasn't happy. They were talking about him behind his back in relation to saying that he smelled, that his personal hygiene wasn't very good, that his taxi, therefore, wasn't very clean. What it did for Bird, that kind of chatter at the taxi rank, 
it kind of reduced his confidence in feeling where he could find sources of support. It's impossible to say which one of the issues haunting Derek Bird would trigger the events of June 2nd, 2010, but what is now clear is that he was keeping an inner turmoil to himself. He clearly, at the point when he, when he did what he did, he was clearly feeling quite isolated, wasn't he? His marriage had broken down some years before, his mum was very, very ill, his father had already died. So he was feeling quite detached, I think, from probably his emotional sources of support, really. Bird's refusal to show emotion was accompanied by a front of relative contentment. Just a few days before June 2nd, he seemed happier than he had been for a long time. He'd given his son 500 pounds for his new grandson. So clearly, there's a sense in which he was also, therefore, not just feeling happier about himself, he was trying to order the world. The visit to his grandchild now seems certain to be evidence that Bird had made a decision. The important decision is the decision to kill himself, because having settled on that, he's then free to do all the other things that he then goes on to do. And I'm not surprised to hear that he left money for his grandchild. It seemed like he, he was going around almost saying goodbye before he, he did what he did. Derek Bird, good with guns and cars, had made up his mind. He decided, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my own life, but before I take my own life, I'm going to right the wrongs that I feel have been done to me. He was carrying a, a shotgun, a double-barreled, and a 2-2 um, rifle, which I think held a magazine of maybe 11 bullets and was sort of bolt-loaded. There is nothing, nothing more dangerous than a man who doesn't care if he's going to die. Derek Bird's mind was in turmoil. He had lost a steady job, a wife and family, and he felt the respect of his fellow taxi drivers. He was also convinced that he was to lose his life savings to pay a tax bill, and that he was being conned by his brother and solicitor. His perception of how things were was beyond how they actually were. But it took him into this kind of dark place. It's almost as if once he was there, he embraced it. It was a complete Jekyll and Hyde. Bird had two guns, a shotgun and a high-powered rifle. He packed them both in his cab and drove to the beautiful hamlet of Lamplu, where his successful businessman brother David lived. His twin was in his house alone. Derek Bird's killing started in the early hours of the 2nd of June, and it started with his brother shot through a closed bedroom door. I think shot his brother in about 11 times. He emptied all of those rounds in, and into his brother's body. And this is a terrible, awful, dark and malicious thing that's going on here. Bird left his 11th shot for his brother's face. When he shot his twin brother in the face, he would clearly have been looking at a ghastly image of what was going to happen to himself. If you're shooting someone in the face, it's also about losing face. It's also about how face-to-face -face societies can support. But if the wheel comes off in those societies, there's no place to hide. And you feel that you cannot re-establish your honor in any other way than doing something as heinous and dramatic as Bird. His next target was the other man that he felt had been conspiring against him. Again, Birdie wrongly assumed solicitor Kevin Commons was involved in an elaborate scheme to defraud him. Derek Bird kind of lay in wait really on Kevin Commons' drive. So as Kevin Commons was leaving his house, Derek Bird, I suppose effectively, ambushed him, and shot him and killed him just a few meters really from his own front door. At the county's emergency ambulance headquarters, news was reaching staff of the unfolding horror. The first time we were aware of what was happening on the 2nd of June was our air desk phoned us to tell us that there was uh, somebody um, going around West Cumbria shooting people and at, at that time there were um, two people who had been confirmed to have uh, been killed in the incident. Given that he'd lived there all his life, Derek Bird probably knew that West Cumbria has the smallest 24-hour hospital in the UK. 
We immediately knew that this was something that was unusual. We had no idea what was going to happen next. And there may be more than one casualty, because even the first uh, call indicated that the, the person was still at large. Being a very rural area, we do deal with shootings, but they're not really the type of shootings that, that this was. They're not acts of aggression shootings, they're generally accidents, and the majority of shootings that we have will involve farming communities or gamekeepers who've accidentally discharged weapons, usually into their feet. By the time reporter Ben Weeder had reached the service commemorating the lives of two children killed in a bus crash two weeks earlier, word about Bird's atrocity was filtering out to the general community. I heard somebody there, just one of the mourners, used the term birdie, uh, which I think some people referred to Derek Bird as, uh, said, oh, I can't believe it's birdie. I was in his taxi just the other week. It is shortly after 10.30 on June 2nd, and Derek Bird has killed two men. Most of those living locally know nothing about it. Two hours of murderous mayhem is about to begin. So then he headed into Whitehaven, to the taxi rank at Duke Street, where he shot and killed um, Darren Rucastle. That was the first one that the police were sure and openly reported that somebody had been shot and killed. So when we knew about Darren Rucastle, we didn't know that the first two victims had been killed. Rucastle had been one of the drivers who Bird believed was ridiculing and stealing customers from him. His death was to begin the second phase of Bird's killing spree. I've met and worked with murderers who will say, if you've killed one, you may as well kill more than one. So at that stage, he knew he was going to be prosecuted for that behavior anyway. So why not continue to eke revenge on other people in the community, this face-to-face -face society that he felt had not given him due deference? The people now at risk from Derek Bird were those who believed him to be a friend, fellow taxi drivers like Terry Kennedy. As I'm going down Court Road, I look from one end to the other, and I could see a police car with flashing lights. And I said to me, customer, um, they're after somebody. And then I noticed Derek Bird's taxi in front. By 10.35, Bird had killed three times. Cumbria police have dispatched armed officers to the scene, but the geography of the county gives Bird the chance to act with impunity. They're as much as an hour away, and Bird was able to drive where he liked. He knew the back roads. The feelings of frustration must have been enormous. If you don't know where the, the threat is at the given time, you know, you, you, everything becomes conjecture. Unarmed police decided the only option was to get people off the streets and to get the word out. We were broadcasting to tell people in Whitehaven and Seascale and Egremont to stay indoors because basically there was a gunman on the loose. He wasn't entering pubs, he wasn't entering buildings. So basically, he was saying, go indoors, put the bolts on. He might have cut this death toll in half. Terry Kennedy, not listening to the local radio, was completely unaware of the mortal danger he was in as his friend Birdie drove towards him. He was getting closer and closer, and then he put his window down, and he put his hand out and waved to me to stop. So I pulled up beside him, and when I turned round, there was the gun straight up against my window. There was a bang, a flash, and I must have let me put up the clutch, and I must have pulled my car forward about three or four metres, which took me out of his shooting line again. Terry Kennedy had been shot at point-blank range. The policeman ran over. He come to me passenger, took the passenger out, and he thought he must have thought I was dead, because like everyone else, there was blood all over my head. He thought he'd blow my head off the same as the rest. Kennedy lives, but loses an arm. With one taxi driver dead and another fighting serious injuries, Bird was still not satisfied. He goes hunting for other drivers and shoots at a further three in the next half hour. He was on an adrenaline rush. He was filled with power. Having those guns, taking those lives, gave him a sense of power and control that he did not feel in other aspects of his life. He was enjoying the idea that he felt invincible. By 10.50, Bird's targets are no longer taxi drivers. 
Two years earlier, he'd been attacked by a group of teenagers and robbed. He now aims shots at a group of young men. He drives past a teenage girl. She is spared. The injuries that we received in the hospital were very variable. The gunman was a good shot and was aiming at people's heads. So the people we saw either had near misses and had facial injuries, or uh, were running away and had injuries to their back and chest, or they had injuries to their hands or limbs that they put up in self-defense. Uh, the people that died had direct point-blank uh, gunshot injuries from a 12 bore to the head. Shooting people in the face was an, uh, an instinct on the day. I think this was something that very clearly Derek Bird had thought about. Most murders, and certainly these spree killings, are about re-establishing some sense of order. And I think in Bird's shooting spree, we see a sort of righteous slaughter. We see a sense of him believing that somehow by him engaging in these dreadful crimes, he was reworking the world in a way that he would like the world to work. And Bird had only just begun reordering that world. There is no doubt that this man had crossed over to the dark side entirely. At around 10.55, Derek Bird leaves Whitehaven, but his killing spree is far from over. There were other scores to settle, innocent bystanders to target. He sets off on a route towards Cellar Field, where years earlier he'd lost his job. His first stop is in a town called Egremont, where he beckons a man to his car and asks for the time. Then he shoots him, again in the face. Reporter Ben Meader was by now following a cordon of police cars chasing Bird. Actually on the bridge, I could see, uh, couldn't make out the figure, but you could see it was definitely a body under a blanket lying on the bridge. Um, so I pulled in there, obviously. That was the sort of first victim that um, I'd seen. It turned out to be a chap called Kenneth Fishburne. It's possible that Bird recognized Kenneth Fishburne. He was a retired Sellafield worker. A grudge against a former employer repaid by proxy. Four were now dead, but those who knew Bird simply did not believe he was the crazed gunman running amok. They had the TVs on, saying what, had, you know, the news, what had gone on and who it was. And when they mentioned dead birds, I just didn't believe it. I really didn't think he could do something like that. By 11.20, phase three of Bird's killing spree had begun. Though he had still some scores to settle, specific targets in mind, he began shooting at anyone walking the streets of Cumbria. I think Derek Bird probably spent most of his life wanting to be the person that, for that two hours, engaged in the shooting spree. But I think in the two hours of the shooting spree, Derek Bird felt he had respect that people had to pay him attention. People had to get out of his way. People had to note where he was, what he said, what he was doing. Susan Hughes is a woman walking the streets of Egremont at the wrong time. One of her daughters is severely disabled and Susan is her full-time carer. She's returning from the shops when Bird spots her. Derry Bird drove past, he saw her, he had his window down and he, he shot her as he drove past first with the, the shotgun. Then he stopped the car just a little bit past from where she, she was and where she'd been hit, um, and he got out of the car. He had failed to kill her and wanted to be certain. Susan Hughes was shot in total about four times. A witness who had been driving past had described seeing them um, struggling on, on the pavement, even though she'd been shot already. Um, and it seems there had been a brief struggle and Derek Bird then had used the, the 2 2 rifle to, to shoot her two or three more times at point blank range, just on the, on the side of the road. Bird heads to a village nearby where he knows a scuba diving instructor lives. The two men had previously fallen out. Bird parks outside his house and sounds the horn. Eventually the man's wife appears to see Bird about to drive away. She'd had a lucky escape, but an elderly couple who were passing by were not so fortunate. First, Bird shot the 68-year-old Mrs. Jennifer Jackson, and then her husband, 67-year-old James. 
After that, he carried on driving, and just along a, a back road, he drove past um, an old old gentleman called Isaac Dixon, uh, just walking along the side of the road, who he shot and killed. Then uh, carried on on the way to Gosforth, another um, sort of little village heading further south in the county. He uh, saw a fellow called um, Gary Purdom, who was 31. He was a, a farmer, also very keen amateur rugby league player. So he was obviously very well known because rugby league is, is so big in this part of the world. He stopped and shot and killed him too. By 11.33, the police armed response unit is still minutes away. An armed unit based at the nuclear processing plant has been put on alert. Bird is heading in their direction. The air ambulance is unable to even rescue the stricken victims. The dangers that we faced on that day were the potential to be um, a big object in the sky flying over somebody that had a high-powered rifle. And really the last thing we want to be doing is being in the air as a target. We aren't a military aircraft, we are an air ambulance. Um, we aren't trained to go into hostile environments. Um, we're trained to go in and save people. So until we knew exactly where he was and that he had been contained, it really was just too dangerous to go into that location. With no armed officers yet at the scene, Bird is able to continue his killing spree. He heads for the village nearest the Sellafield plant, Seascale. Within three minutes, he kills one man before wounding another. He shot and killed a lad in a smart car on the way into Seascale, and as he'd shot him, it, this, the vehicle had gone off the road. He then kills a cyclist before seeing Jane Robinson, who was delivering catalogues door to door. He shoots her at point blank range. He knows neither of his victims. They were simply in a village next to a place Derek Bird had lost his job. Each time they're shot, Bird follows the same killing pattern. A shotgun to the face, then a rifle shot to the head. He would shoot people in the face. There's a sense in which shooting someone in the face is about obliterating their personality, denying them individuality, taking their individuality away, reducing them to everybody being the same. By now, the rescue ambulance had been ordered into the air. On board, they could see the carnage. On a couple of occasions, we had to drop very low and, and almost follow roads um, to get us to that location. Um, it was actually while we were doing that that the kind of full horror of the whole day became event because we, we were passing over some of the victims' positions and we could see police cars at these um, and cars off the road in ditches. As the helicopter lands a safe distance away, Bird drives from Seascale. It's 11.40. He heads inland, shooting at a further six other people. None were killed. He follows a winding route and by 12.30 is nearing the village of Boot. Police marksmen are now within a few hundred yards. But some living locally, as well as tourists, still don't know. There's a spree killer heading their way. When Derek Bird was in a situation where he could have picked his target, you could have deployed a battalion of soldiers, and they might still have been ineffectual. Twelve forty. Police are closing in on Derek Bird. He's killed twelve, injured another twenty-five. His killing spree had taken place in one of the remotest places in England, and most of the slaughter had taken less than two hours. By now, the police were out in force chasing him. Every single armed police officer in Cumbria had been uh, sort of dispatched to chase him. Armed officers from Sellafield, a nuclear site, civil nuclear constabulary, don't usually get involved in regular policing, but they had been sort of dispatched to, to look for him. Uh, armed police officers from surrounding counties, they were all sort of converging. Helicopters from the RAF and the police were after him. Since he had shot at his fellow taxi drivers 90 minutes before, Bird has been killing at random. Nobody he sees is safe as he crosses Dr. Bridge into Boot. He is nearly out of fuel and his car collides with a cab. He lost a tire, he knew the game was up, the adrenaline rush was off. Uh, the adrenaline rush obviously inevitably uh, fades, diminishes. At five past one, police close in on the car. Bird is not inside. He's left behind one of his two weapons. Police assume he's searching for more victims, and they themselves are now very much in the firing line. He went into Woodland. The armed police caught up with him there. 
and started uh, basically advancing into the woodland to, to find him. Now these police officers were later really praised for their bravery because they didn't know what they were potentially walking into. He was an absolute lethal threat who has opened fire and has taken life. If you can't see that suspect, it's an absolute nightmare. They had to go forward believing that they were going to go into a gunfight. In fact, they had to go forward towards the conclusion um, in the belief that they were probably going to get ambushed. Despite the danger, police did not want to shoot and kill Derek Bird. You can neutralise by negotiation. You can bring things to a peaceful ending uh, if you possibly can. You know, the mantra for a firearms incident is that um, a successful firearms incident is one where no shots are fired. Police slowly combed the woods around Boot. At 1.40 in the afternoon of June the 2nd, they discover the body of Derek Bird. He had placed the rifle to his head and pulled the trigger, which he had done 50 times or more that day already, leaving a trail of dead or injured in his wake. When he decided to kill, I would think that lurking the deep, deep in the back of his mind was the fact that he was, he was going to take his own life. And if he could kill once, he could do it many times to become what criminologists describe as a spree killer. What you've got in the case of someone like Mr. Bird is someone who knows he's going to kill himself. So in a way, it doesn't matter about the police anymore. He's not going to be running about scared or being stealthy. He's not, he's not trying to evade the law. He can do these killings in a calm and relaxed manner. I think what's clear, though, is that by taking his own life, he is not in any way showing remorse for his behavior. He's simply controlling a judgment about his behavior that the state would have made if it had arrested him. Taking his own life was preventing the state from judging him, from passing sentence on him, from punishing him. The man steeped in the remote world of West Cumbria had painstakingly taken revenge for perceived insults on the people against whom he had grudges and the places associated with his humiliations. Innocents, caught in the crossfire of his life story, were put to death. His employment as a taxi driver allowed him to drive for 45 miles from the first shooting incident to where he'd ultimately take his own life on B roads, single track roads, roads that the police couldn't get access to very quickly. These villages were very, very important in terms of the character that he became. For those close to him, forgiveness. Terry Kennedy, maimed for life, even attended Bird's funeral. Terry Bird done the shootings and everything else, but Terry Bird didn't know he was doing them shootings. It wasn't the same man you know, I used to go on holiday with or I used to work with or anything like that. He had lost it that day. But it certainly wasn't Terry Bird that I knew. Well, Terry's never ever blamed him. He's never bl blamed Derek for what happened to him. I don't know what other people have thought or... But as far as Terry and I are concerned, it wasn't Derek himself. It was like something had flipped in his head that made him go like this. And perhaps the most tragic irony is that Derek Bird had little or nothing to hold grudges about. The blood brother he killed, his twin David, was not as successful as Derek thought. You just have to be blunt. Derek Bird was somebody who got things wrong at virtually every point in his life. You know, even, even after his death, we discover that he had more money than his twin brother. As for fears that he was to lose his home or might be imprisoned, Bird got that wrong too. We discover that he isn't going to be investigated by the Inland Revenue. Derek Bird got things wrong almost throughout his life, from his divorce to not understanding the jokes that were being made, the banter that would naturally go on at the taxi rank. Perhaps the most tragic part of Bird's life was that he simply did not give voice to the worries that he kept largely to himself. He was a man's man, and men don't cry. Here was a man who didn't have the psychological resources to say, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I'm worried, can you help? That's ultimately Derek Bird's legacy, isn't it? That 
men brought up with that kind of black and white masculinity are actually men who often get things dangerously wrong.